Thanks for watching, and today we'll talk about the half integral of x, which is halfway between the function x and the integral x squared over 2. But first, let's talk about the elephant in the room. How would you even write half integral? Would you write it like this? Or would you write it like this? Well, neither. Today we'll write it as i to the 1 half of x. So half integral of x. All right, now let's see how to evaluate this. In order to do that, let's do it by analogy. Well, if you take a power function x to the n, if you integrate it, then what happens is one power comes up, x to the n plus 1, and you divide by that power, usually plus some constant, but here let's ignore the constant. And then if you play the spiel again, you get the double integral of x to the n. Now again, another power comes up, x to the n plus 2, divided by n plus 2, but we also have this n plus 1. And well, n plus 2 times n plus 1, this looks like the beginning of a factorial. And in fact, if you multiply top and bottom by n factorial, then you do get that the denominator becomes n plus 2 factorial. So the half, the double integral of x to the n is n factorial over x plus, so n plus 2 factorial times x to the n plus 2. So since the double integral of x to the n becomes this over n plus 2 factorial times x to the n plus 2, you may suggest that the half integral of x to the n is the same thing but with one half. And indeed, that's a very good ansatz that will follow. So i to the one half of x to the n, that is n factorial over n plus one half factorial times x to the n plus one half. This is all in good, except this denominator here doesn't really make sense. Factorials, they're just defined for integers. And the question is, how can you extend the notion of factorials for non-integers? What saves us here is, drum roll, the gamma function. So there's this wonderful creature called gamma of z, which is defined via an integral. So integral from 0 to infinity, x to the z minus 1, e to the minus x, dx. And what you have to understand here is that x is just a dummy variable which gets integrated out. So this is really a function of z. And the cool thing is this does have properties very similar to the gamma function. And in fact, for integers n, yes, greater or equal to 1, gamma of n is the same thing as n minus 1 factorial. Or conversely, n factorial, it's gamma of n plus 1. And it also has a multiplicative property similar to n plus 1 factorial equals n plus 1 times n factorial. But in this case, what we get is that gamma of z plus 1 is z times gamma of z. So slightly different, but the cool thing is we can use this gamma function now to define the half integral of x to the n. All you do, you replace factorials by gamma of stuff plus 1 because of this property. And so now the half integral of x to the n becomes simply gamma of n plus 1 over gamma of n plus 1 half plus 1. So gamma of n plus 3 halves times x to the n plus 1 half. And finally, we can now define the half integral of x. 
simply by plugging in n equals 1. So the half integral of x that becomes now gamma of 2 over gamma of 1 plus 3 halves, so 5 halves, x to the 1 plus 1 half, so x to the 3 halves. And the cool news is we can actually evaluate those gamma functions explicitly to get a very concrete formula for the half integral of x. But already here, this formula is pretty neat because it exhibits a nice property of the half integral. Because if you integrate x, a whole power comes up. Integral of x is x squared over 2. Well, here, half integral of x, notice half a power comes up, which it's what it's supposed to be, I think. OK, and now let's evaluate those gamma functions. So gamma of 2, remember this factorial business. That's 2 minus 1 factorial. So 1 factorial, which is 1. So the top is 1. And now the bottom, well, gamma of 5 halves, Remember, gamma has this multiplicative property, so it's 3 halves times gamma of 3 halves. And you can even do better, that's 3 halves times 1 half gamma of 1 half. And so really, we get 3 quarters, and the only thing to evaluate is this gamma of 1 half and we can do that explicitly, and you may see a friend or a frenemy in this case. Because what is gamma of 1 half? You have to see it. This is integral from 0 to infinity of x to the 1 half minus 1, so x to the z minus 1, e to the minus x dx, and that becomes integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over square root of x, e of minus x, dx. And 1 over square root of x, it's almost the derivative of square root of x, which suggests to use the following new substitution. Let u be square root of x, then du is 1 over 2 square root of x dx. So 1 over square root of x dx, this junk here, is just 2 du. And well, u at 0 is 0, u at infinity is infinity. So really, what this transforms to is the integral from 0 to infinity of e of minus u squared 2 du. But e of minus u squared, it's an even function. So 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity is just the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e of minus u squared du. And what is this? It's the Gaussian integral, so which is equal to square root of pi. So this gamma of 1 half is square root of pi, which now completes our derivation of the half integral of x. Because what did we get? The half integral of x, it's 1 over, remember this 3 quarter business, gamma of 1 half, which is square root of pi, x to the 3 halves, which if you'd like, you can just write as 4 over 3 square root of pi, x to the 3 halves. Wow, how cool is that, right? That we have this explicit expression. And last but not least, I just wanted to tell you a couple of nice properties because the half integral really behaves the way we want it to behave. And what I mean by that is, for instance, if you half integrate the half integral, of x, then you do get the integral of x, which is x squared over 2. Moreover, the half integral 
of the half derivative. The half derivative of the half integral is the same thing as the half integral of the half derivative of x, which is x, meaning that the half integral is the inverse of the half derivative. And finally, you may ask, what about for other functions? And there's actually a very nice property with sines and cosines, because if you take the half derivative of sine of x, that just shifts sine by pi over 4, sine of x plus pi over 4. Well, believe it or not, if you take the half integral, it shifts it back. So half integral of sine of x, that is sine of x minus pi over 4, which really shows that they're inverses of each other. And before we end this, you may ask, what about applications? I'm sure, again, there's a quantum mechanics interpretation of this. But also, I want to say this is very useful to model what are called broken processes. So things, think you know, processes that are not smooth, maybe you know, some, some fluid that goes to viscous stuff, you know, if you look at it, which makes it hard to move. Turns out you can model this by the half integral. All right, I hope you like this. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.